Globalization is the process in which individual lives and local communities are affected by economic and cultural forces that operate worldwide. In effect, it is a process of the world becoming a single place. Globalism is a perception of the world as a function or result of the processes of globalization upon local communities. The word global has had a rapid rise since the mid-1980s, up until which time the word international was preferred. The rise of the word international itself in the 18th century indicated the growing importance of territorial states in organizing social relations. It can be defined as an early consequence of the worldwide perspective of European imperialism. Similarly, the rapidly increasing interest in globalization reflects a changing organization of worldwide social relations. The nation has begun to have a decreasing importance as individuals and communities, gaining access to globally shared knowledge and culture are affected by economic realities that come and go over the boundaries of the state. The basic structure of globalization is nationalism, on which the concept of internationalism is based. Globalization occurs when people in a national framework are affected by global economy and communication. Part of the complexity of globalism comes from the different ways in which globalization is approached. Some analysts embrace it enthusiastically as a positive feature of a changing world in which access to technology, information, services, and markets will be the benefit to local communities. They believe that by globalization, dominant forms of social organization will lead to a universal prosperity, peace, and freedom. They even expect that perception of a global environment will lead to a global ecological concern. For this group, globalism is a term for values which treat global issues as a matter of personal and collective responsibility. Others reject it as a form of domination by advanced countries over developing ones in which individual distinctions of culture and society become erased by an increasingly homogeneous global culture, while local economies are more firmly incorporated into a system of global capital. For this group, globalism is a political doctrine which provides, explains, and justifies an interlocking system of world trade. It has ideological overtones of historical inevitability and its attendantness function as a gospel of the global market. The chief argument against globalization is that global culture and global economy did not spontaneously spring up, but originated in the centers of capitalist power, which still try to sustain their own economic system. According to this group, in short, the benefits of globalization vary too much from country to country. Proponents of critical globalism take a disinterested view of the process, simply examining its processes and effects. Critical globalism refers to the critical engagement with globalization processes, neither blocking them out nor celebrating globalization. Thus, while critical globalists see that globalization has often sustained poverty, whitened material inequalities, increased ecological degradation, sustained militarism, fragmented communities, marginalized minority groups, fed intolerance, and deepened crisis of democracy, they also see that it has had a positive effect on the great rise of the average individual income since 1945. Reducing the population in miserable poverty, increasing ecological consciousness, and facilitating disarmament. Academically, globalization covers such disciplines as international relations, political geography, economics, sociology, communication studies, agricultural, ecological, and cultural studies. It addresses the decreasing influence, though not the status, of the nation-state in the world political order 
and the increasing influence of multinational corporations. Globalization also means easy transportation all over the world. Transnational company operations, the changing pattern of world employment, or global environmental risk. Indeed, there are compelling reasons for thinking globally where the environment is concerned. As a famous scholar puts it, when the ill winds of Chernobyl came our way, they did not pose at the frontier, produce their passports, and say, can I reign on your territory now? A particular problem directly related to continuing population growth is growing global food insecurity. For a variety of reasons, the demand for food by the consumer has begun to alter the capacity to provide. Where all attention was previously focused on population growth as a sole source of demand on available food stocks, today an equally important source of demand has become apparent and that is affluence. As per capita income increases, purchasing power climbs and with it a demand for higher quality foods, especially foods of animal origin such as meat, eggs, milk, and milk products. Eating meat can be considered an inefficient way of utilizing grain. In the United States, it takes three pounds of grain to produce a pound of poetry. Five to one is the ratio for pork and 10 to one for beef. In the end, Americans eat 80% of all the grain they consume indirectly first using it for feed and then consuming the meat. On the basis of these data, Americans consume the equivalent of one ton of grain a year, while inhabitants of poorer countries consume one-fifth as much. Outside our borders, other nations with growing economies but without comparable agriculture have also increased their appetites for animal protein. Hence, 60% of North American agricultural sales has been to nations whose people are already rather well fed. At this time, the approximately 1 billion people of the developed world feed enough grain to their livestock and poultry to provide minimal nutritional requirements to another 2 billion people. Over the last 20 years, the rich minority of the world has doubled its meat consumption. This is, however, not due to eating twice as much meat per capita, although there has been some rise here. Rather, there are twice as many people with the money to buy a higher quality protein-rich diet. The net result is that while world population has been growing at 1.6% and agricultural production at 2.5%, World demand for food has been increasing at 3% per year. It is to our advantage and the world's as well that the United States grain harvests in recent years have resulted in enormous yields. Overflowing granaries and low grain prices are the mark of this high productivity. But the great increases in food production have not occurred where populations are growing the fastest. Gains in production require modern energy intensive methods, combining irrigation, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, genetics, and mechanization. One reason, among several, why poor countries have lagged behind in food production is because their farmers have not had access to appropriate technologies, such as sufficient fertilizers, irrigation, improved seas, pesticides, storage facilities, and transportation. The world's poor are thus driven to world food markets to supplement their needs. However, they must compete there with richer nations whose own increased demands have forced the price of grain upward. With food prices rising beyond their purchasing power, the poor country can buy less and less with their precious dollars. According to some estimates, 
world agriculture could produce enough to feed up to 30 billion people. What appears to be a food shortage may, in fact, be an uneven worldwide distribution of economic power. We have the producer nations with surpluses to sell, the affluent consumer nations who have money to buy, and the low-income consumer countries that cannot effectively compete in the world food market. These differentials represent an ever-growing number of hungry people. Thus, there is famine in some parts of the world, most notably on the Indian subcontinent and some countries with Africa and Latin America, and an overabundance of food in a number of others. Primary education in Britain begins at the age of five. Parents have a responsibility to educate their children, but not always in schools. And yet, until recently, homeschooling was associated with zealous parents having eccentric ideas. Today, however, dinner table conversations among middle-class parents who are conscious of their children's education often lead to debate about the pros and cons of educating children at home. A depressing catalog of complaints, large classes, bullying, and school violence, teaching standards, and despair with the incessant pressure of examinations has led many parents to think the unthinkable. It is estimated that 140,000 children, about 1.5% of the school population, are homeschooled in Britain, a growth of about 10% during the past year. About half of these children have been withdrawn from school. The rest were homeschooled from the start. So why are more parents choosing this option? The new generation of home teachers tends to be motivated more by fears that their children are not thriving in conventional schools. A mother of a seven-year-old daughter in an industrial town, for example, is pragmatic about her decision to take her daughter out of her local primary school. Her teachers lack the ability to stimulate and encourage her, claims she, who is not committed to homeschooling on principle. I would put her back in the system if there was a decent school in this area. The fear of bullying is also often raised. The perception that schools are unsafe places drives many parents to the conclusion that they should educate at home even if only six months until the bullying is resolved. Another mother, who is also representative of a homeschooling support group, says that the erosion of classroom discipline means that many schools resemble a war zone. She believes that it is now group pressure rather than teachers that dominates the classroom. Some parents worry that children who are either specially gifted or have learning difficulties are often overlooked within a highly bureaucratic school system. A mother, who is as well an author of a book on a woman's role at home, has decided to school her daughters at home throughout the primary years. She argues that schools often fail to respond to the individual needs of children. The growth of home education is not simply a reflection of the unhappy state of the British education system. It can also reflect the fact that modern-day parents are more concerned with the task of child raising than ever before. Our overprotective parenting has led to a steady expansion of the amount of time mothers and fathers spend looking after their children, and a corresponding reduction in the freedom children are given to explore their world with one another. Homeschooling takes this one step farther. In addition, it is surprisingly easy to begin homeschooling. Parents do not even need permission from the local education authority to educate their families at home. However, those who withdraw their child from school in England and Wales need to inform the head of their education authority. After this, parents can expect education officers to inquire about the arrangements they are making. Most authorities take a fairly hands-off attitude. 
the representative of a homeschooling support group notes that home educating families are visited once a year for a half hour session. She found these visits useful since they affirmed that what she was teaching was on the right track. There is also an elaborate network of support available to those opting to home educate. Materials and advice for different levels of teaching are readily available on the internet as well as in books and other publications. Many parents join local support groups. In principle, there is no reason children cannot be successfully educated at home, although it is more difficult as they get older. While there are some successful cases, few parents are equipped to teach mathematics and science beyond the basic level. Others might ask, do children educated at home gain the social skills necessary to relate to their age group and the outside world? Most supporters of homeschooling say yes, but sound a little defensive on this subject. One supporter says, we spend a considerable amount of time scheduling group activities for the children. So what's the downside of home education? It is a loss of free time for the home teacher. That was why a mother who lives in South London packed in her experiment. She removed her 12-year-old and 13-year-old from their state schooling because of concern about their education, but gave up homeschooling after just over a year. One year of home teaching finished me off, she recalls. Her solution was to move near a good school. Homeschooling is time consuming if it is done properly and leaves little space to run a career, look after other children or run a home. Since time is the one thing most modern day adults lack, it seems likely that despite its growth, home teaching will be used only by a small minority of parents. Indeed, many children are taken out of schools for only short periods of time before their parents resume their careers. The concept of retirement is a modern one. In the 1870s, the German statesman Bismarck introduced 65 as the age at which citizens could stop working and receive a pension. This was a humane initiative at a time when work usually meant heavy manual labor and life expectancy was much lower than it is now. The typical retirement age for men has been set at around 65 in most developed countries since the Second World War. Though women live longer, their retirement age has generally been set rather lower. But in recent years, people have been retiring willingly or unwillingly much earlier as young as 50 in some cases, mainly because many companies have been trying to reduce the size of their workforce. Some workers have thus been able to look forward to many years of retirement. This, however, is about to change. The reason is the aging of populations. During the 20th century, life expectancies around the world increased by one third. Today, a girl born in a developed country can expect to live well into her 80s, and boy until his early 80s. Meanwhile, since the beginning of the 1950s, global birth rate have helped. The populations of developing countries will keep growing for several more decades because of the number of young people still to reach childbearing age. But the populations of Europe and the rich countries of Asia will shrink and age. The main consequence will be an increased burden on workers. At present, in developed countries, there are about three workers for every pensioner. As the baby boomer generation begins to hit retirement age, this ratio will fall dramatically. By 2030, it is expected to average 1.1 to 1, and in Germany and Italy, it will be 1 to 1 or lower. A distinguished economist has recently written that 
We are confronting such great changes in terms of population that they could redefine economic and political system in the developed countries over the next generation. With unemployment in the USA and some European countries hitting near record lows and significant skills shortages in some areas, a strong push to retain older workers is developing. However, this will require big shifts in attitudes among both employees and employers. A recent Australian survey found that when looking to fill senior management jobs, 60% of companies still preferred people in their 30s, and 65% of companies said employees over 50 will be the first to go. Governments are just beginning to take positive action to counter these prejudices. In Japan, the government is providing financial help to companies to encourage them to retain older workers. In Britain, where early retirement is estimated to cost around $27 billion a year, a major effort is being made to help older unemployed people get back into jobs. The British government minister in charge of employment has declared that the age discrimination is bad for the economy and unfair to the individual. Some companies are now realizing that getting rid of their older workers was, in fact, a false economy. Older workers have lower rates of absenteeism and staying a job longer which saves money on recruitment and training. Also, some companies have discovered that older workers have more respect for their firm's values and traditions. British Telecom recently became the first company in Britain to raise the retirement age for its workers to 70. In the Netherlands, where unemployment is at a 20-year low, Job agencies specializing in recruiting workers over the age of 65 is finding that demand for its services is booming. Not all older people want to be in the workforce, of course, but in a survey in the USA, 80% of baby boomers reported that they intended to continue working after they are 65, at least part-time. Only 13% said they did not ever want to lift a finger again. The issue is thus not only one of economic efficiency, but also of the health and well-being of the fastest growing sector of the population. Though we often complain about them, for most of us, our places of work are where we find conversation, stimulation, friendship, and a reason to get up in the morning. When we are 65, not only will they still need us, but we will also need them. The internet is not just a new technological innovation. It is a new type of technological innovation. One that brings out the very essence of technology. Up to now, technological innovators have generally produced devices that serve needs that were already recognized and then discovered some unexpected side effects. So Alexander Graham Bell thought the telephone would be useful for communication in business, but would not be accepted in people's homes, let alone intrude as they walk down the street. Likewise, Henry Ford thought of the automobile as giving people cheap, reliable, individualized transportation but he did not imagine it will destroy the inner cities and liberate adults and sex. The net is different. It was originally intended for communication between scientists, but now that is a side effect. We have come to realize that the net is too gigantic and pertain for us to think of it as a device for satisfying any specific need, and each new use it affords us a surprise. If the essence of technology is to make everything easily accessible and optimizable, then the internet is a perfect technological device. It is a climax of the same tendency to make everything as flexible as possible that had 
led us to digitalize and interconnect as much of reality as we can. What the web will allow us to do is literally unlimited. This pure flexibility naturally leads people to compete for outrageous predictions as to what the net will become. We are told that, given its new web linking and accessing information, the internet will bring a new era of economic prosperity, lead to the development of intelligent search engines that will deliver to us just the information we desire, solve the problems of mass education, put us in touch with all of reality, allow us to have even more flexible identities than we already have, and thereby add new dimensions of meaning to our lives. But compared with the relative success of e-commerce, the other areas where a new and more fulfilling form of life has been promised have produced a great deal of talk, but few happy results. In fact, researchers at Carnegie Mellon University were surprised to find that when people were given access to the World Wide Web, they found themselves feeling isolated and depressed. The New York Times reports, the results of the $1.5 million project ran completely contrary to expectations of the social scientists who designed it and to many of the organizations that financed the study. We were shocked by the findings because they were counterintuitive to what we know about how socially the internet is being used said Robert Kraut, a social psychology professor at Carnegie Mellon's Human Computer Interaction Institute. We are not thinking here about the extremes. These were normal adults and their families. And on average, for those who use the internet most, things got worse. The researchers sum up their findings as follows. This research examined the social and psychological impact of the internet on 169 people in 73 households during their first one to two years online. In this sample, the internet was used extensively for communication. Nonetheless, greater use of the internet was associated with declines in participants' communication with family members in the household declining in the size of their social circle and increases in their depression and loneliness. The authors conclude that what is missing is people's actual embodied pressure with each other. Online friendships are likely to be more limited than friendships supported by physical closeness because online friends are not fixed firmly in the same day-to-day -day environment. They will be less likely to understand the context of a conversation, making discussion more difficult and rendering support less applicable. Even strong ties maintained at a distance throughout electronic communication likely to be different in kind and perhaps diminished in strength compared with the strong ties supported by being in the same environment. The interpersonal communication applications currently prevalent on the internet or either neutral towards strong ties or tend to undercut rather than promote them. This surprising discovery shows that the internet user disembodiment has profound and unexpected effects. Presumably, it affects people in ways that are different from the way most tools do because it can become the main way its users relate to the rest of the world. Given these surprises and disappointments, we will naturally like to know what are the benefits and the dangers of living our lives through the net. Only then might we hope to have a glimmer concerning what the net can become and what we will become in the process of living through it. By the 1920s, it was thought that no corner of the earth fit for human habitation had remained unexplored. New Guinea, the world's second largest island, was no exception. The European missionaries, planters, and administrators clung to its coastal lowland, convinced that no one could live in the treacherous mountain range that ran in a solid line down the middle of the island. 
But the mountains visible from each coast, in fact, belonged to two ranges, not one. And between them was a mightly warm plateau, crossed by many fertile valleys. A million Stone Age people lived in those highlands, isolated from the rest of the world for 40,000 years. The veil would not be lifted until gold was discovered in a tributary of one of the main rivers. The gold rush that followed attracted many prospectors, including Michael Leahy, an Australian who on May 26, 1930, set out to look for gold in the mountains with a fellow prospector and a group of native lowland people hired as couriers. After climbing the height, Leahy was amazed to see grassy open country on the other side. By nightfall, his amazement turned to alarm because there were points of light in the distance, obvious signs that the valley was populated. After a sleepless night in which Leahy and his party loaded their weapons and assembled a crude bomb, they made their first contact with the Highlanders. The astonishment was mutual, like he wrote in his diary. It was a relief when the native came in sight, the men in front armed with bows and arrows, the woman behind brings stalks of sugar cane. When he saw the woman, one of the native couriers told me at once, that there would be no fight. We waved to them to come on, which they did cautiously, stopping every few years to look us over. When a few of them finally got up courage to approach, we could see that they were utterly thunderstruck by our appearance. When I took off my hat, those nearest to me backed away in terror. One old man came forward with open mouth and touched me to see if I was real. Then he knelt down and wrapped his hands over my bare legs, possibly to find if they were painted, and grabbed me around the knees and hacked them, rubbing his bushy hat against me. The woman and children gradually got up courage to approach also, and presently, the camp was swarming with a lot of them, all running about and jabbering at once, pointing to everything that was new to them. That jabbering was language, an unfamiliar language, one of 800 different ones that will be discovered among the isolated Highlanders right up through the 1960s. Leahy's first contact repeated a scene that must have taken place hundreds of times in human history, whenever one people first encountered another. All of them, as far as we know, already had language. No mute tribe has ever been discovered, and there is no record that a region has served as a cradle of language from which is spread to previously languageless groups. As in every other case, the language spoken by Leahy's host turned out to be no mere jabber, but a medium that could express abstract concepts, invisible entities, and complex trains of reasoning. The Highlanders consulted each other intensively, trying to agree upon the nature of the light-skinned beings. The leading opinion was that they were ancestors that came back to this world with renewed bodies or other spirits in human form, perhaps one that turned back into skeletons at night. They agreed upon an empirical test that would settle the matter. One of our people hid, recalls one of the Highlanders, and watched them going to excrete. He came back and said, those men from heaven went to excrete over there. Once they had left, many men went to take a look. When they saw that it smelled bad, they said, Their skin might be different, but their shit smells bad like ours. 
that universality of complex language is a discovery that fills linguists with awe, and is the first reason to suspect that language is not just any cultural invention, but the product of a special human instinct. Cultural inventions vary widely in their sophistication from society to society. Within a society, the inventions are generally at the same level of sophistication. Some groups count by curving lines on bone and cook on fires lit by spinning sticks in logs. Others use computers and microwave ovens. Language, however, ruins this correlation. There are Stone Age societies, but there is no such thing as a Stone Age language. Early in the last century, the anthropological linguist Edward Sapir wrote, When it comes to linguistic form, Plato walks with the Macedonian swine herd, Confucius with the head-hunting savage of Assam. As you read this sentence, you are one of approximately 1.6 billion people who will use English in some form today. Although English is the mother tongue of only 380 million people, it is a language of the lion's share of the world's books, academic papers, newspapers, and magazines. American radio, television, and blockbuster films export English language pop culture worldwide. Whether we regard the spread of English as benign globalization or linguistic imperialism, its expensive reach is undeniable. Yet, professional linguists hesitate to predict far into the future the further globalization of English. Historically, languages have risen and fallen with the military, economic, cultural, or religious powers that supported them. Beyond the ebb and flow of history, there are other reasons to suppose that the English language will eventually wane in influence. For one, English actually reaches and is then utilized by only a small and atypically fortunate minority. Furthermore, the kinds of interactions identified with globalization from trade to communication have also encouraged regionalization and with it the spread of regional languages. Finally, the spread of English and regional languages collectively have created pressure on small communities, producing pockets of local language revival resistant to global change. Globalization has done little to change the reality that, regardless of location, the spread of English is closely linked to social class, age, gender, and profession. Just because a wide array of young people around the world may be able to sing along to a new Madonna song, does not mean that they can hold a simple conversation in English, or even understand what Madonna is saying. The brief formal educational contact that most learners have with English is too limited to produce lasting literacy, fluency, or even comprehension. Indeed, for all the enthusiasm generated by grand-scale globalization, it is a growth in regional interactions. Trade, travel, the spread of regions, inter-ethnic marriages that touches the widest array of local populations. These interactions promote the spread of regional languages. Mandarin Chinese is spreading throughout China and in some of its southern neighbors. Spanish is spreading in the Americas, and Arabic is spreading in North Africa and Southeast Asia, both as a language of Islam and as an important language of regional trade. The importance of regional languages should increase steadily in the near future. Even if the end result of globalization is to make the world smaller, its scope seems to foster the need for more intimate local connections among many individuals. 
In most communities, the local language serves a strong symbolic function as a clear mark of authenticity. Authenticity reflects a perceived line from a culturally idealized past to the present, carried by the language and traditions associated with the community's origins. It amounts to a central core of cultural beliefs and interpretations that are not only resistant to globalization, but are actually reinforced by the threat that globalization seems to present to these historical values. Scholars may argue that cultural identities change over time in response to specific reward system, but locals often resist such explanations and defend authenticity and local mother tongues against the perceived threat of globalization with near religious order. As a result, never before in history have there been as many standardized languages as there are today, roughly 1,200. Many smaller languages, even those with far fewer than 1 million speakers, have benefited from state-sponsored or voluntary preservation movements. In the Basque, Catalan, and Galician regions of Spain, such movements are fiercely political and frequently involve staunch resistance to the Spanish government over political and linguistic rights. In addition to invoking the subjective importance of local roads, People who encourage local languages defend continuing to use them on practical groups. Local towns foster higher levels of school success, higher degrees of participation in local government, more informed citizenship, and better knowledge of one's own culture, history, and faith. Navajo children who were schooled initially in Navajo were found to have higher reading competency in English than those who were first schooled in English. Government and relief agencies can also use local languages to spread information about industrial and agricultural techniques as well as modern healthcare to diverse audiences. Development workers in West Africa, for example, have found that the best way to teach the vast number of farmers with little or no formal education how to sow and rotate crops for higher yields is in these local towns. The world's practical reliance on local languages today is every bit as great as the identity roles these languages fulfill. What is to become of English? There is no reason to assume that English will always be as necessary as it is today, particularly after its regional rivals experience their own growth spurts. Civilization will not sink into the sea if and when that happens. The decline of the use of English around the world does not mean the values associated today with its spread must decline. Ultimately, democracy, international trade, and economic development can flourish in any town. I am on the bus traveling through the desert between Ketaman and Yast when we pull over to a checkpoint. Checkpoints are common along Iranian highways and I've grown accustomed to stopping every hundred miles or so to watch the driver climb out, papers in hand. Sometimes a guard in a dark green uniform enters the bus and walks up and down the aisle. Eyes flicking from side to side, pistol gleaming in the shadowed interior light. This is one of those times. The bus falls silent as a young guard enters, and we all determinedly stare straight ahead, as if by our pretending to ignore the guard, he will ignore us. We listen to his footfall sound, then the Persian carpet, the lines of the aisle, turn, and come back again. He reaches the front of the bus 
and makes a half turn toward the door. But then, just as we begin to collect a deep breath, he surprises us by completing his turn and starting down the aisle again. This time to tap various passengers on the shoulder. They gather their belongings together and move slowly out of the bus and up the steps of a cement block building. I sit frozen, hoping that the guard will not notice me and the blonde hair sticking out of my rosary or headscarf. I've seen guards pull passengers off buses before, and although it never seems to be anything serious, the passengers always return within five or ten minutes, I just as soon remain in my seat. The guard climbs out the bus and I relax, wondering what, if anything, he's looking for. I've been told that these searches are usually about drugs and smuggling, but to me, they seem to be more about the display of power. The guard is back, and instinctively, I know why. He points to me. Me? I gesture, still not completely convinced that he wants me. After two months in Iran, I've learned that, contrary to what I had expected, Foreigners are seldom bothered here. You, he knows. Copying my fellow passengers, I gather my belongings together and stand up. Everyone is staring at me. As usual, I'm the only foreigner on the bus. I climb out, nearly falling over my long black raincoat. It or something similar being required for all women in public of Iran. My heart is knocking against my chest. The guard and one of his colleagues are waiting for me on the steps of the guardhouse. At their feet is my back, which they've dragged out the belly of the bass. It looks like a fat green watermelon. Passport, the young guard bugs in Parisian. I hand him my crisp dark blue document suddenly feeling that United States of America is printing across the front much too boldly. I remember someone back home wearing me to put a cover on my passport before entering Iran. Too late now. Visa? I show him the appropriate page in my passport. Where are you coming from? His Persian has a strange accent that I haven't heard before. Kermen, I say. Where are you going to? Yes, tourist? I nod, thinking there is no need to complicate matters by telling him that I'm here in Iran to write a safarname, the Persian word for travel log or literally travel letter. But then immediately I wonder if I've done the right thing. My visa says journalist. Slowly, the young guard flips through the pages of my passport, examining the immigration stamps and the rules and regulations listed in the bag. He studies my picture long and hard, and then passes my passport to his unsmiling colleague, who asks me the same questions I've just been asked. Where are you coming from? Ketterman? Where are you going to? Yes. Tourist? I nod again. I can't change my answer now. The second guard hands my passport back to the first, who reluctantly hands it back to me. I look at his smooth, boyish face and wonder if he's old enough to shave. Is this your suitcase? He says. Looking at my bag. Yes, I sigh and move to open it. He shakes his head. All the other passengers are now back on the bus, and I wonder how much longer the girls will keep me. What will happen, I worry, if the bus leaves without me? We are out in the middle of the desert. There are no other buildings in sight. Hardened dust white plains, broken only by thin grass, stretch in all directions. The sky is a pale metallic dome sucking the color and moisture out of the landscape. 
clearing his throat, the first guard stares at me intently. His eyes are an unusual smoke blue, framed by long lashes. They're the same eyes I've noticed before on more than a few Iranians. He looks at his colleague and they whisper together. Sweat is slipping down their foreheads and down mine. Then the first guard straightens his shoulders, takes a deep breath and blushes. Thank you, he says carefully in step, self-conscious English. Nice to meet you. Hello. The second guard is now blushing as furiously as the first. How are you? He falls back into Persian, only some of which I understand. We will never forget this day. You are the first American we have met. Welcome to Islamic Republic Iran. Go with Allah. Culture is a set of shared ideals, values, and standards of behavior. It is a common element that allows the members of a society to correctly interpret each other's actions and gives meaning to their lives. Because they share a common culture, people can predict how others are most likely to behave in a certain circumstance and react accordingly. A group of people from different cultures deserted on an uninhabited island for a period of time might appear to become a sort of society. They will have a common interest, survival, and will develop techniques for living and working together. Each of the members of this group, however, will retain his or her own identity and cultural background. And the group will break up easily as soon as its members were rescued from the island. The group would have been merely a collection of individuals without a unified cultural identity. Society may be defined as a group of people who not only are dependent on each other for survival, but also share a common culture. How these people depend upon each other can be seen in such things as their economic systems and their family relationships. Moreover, members of society are held together by a sense of common identity. The role-governed relationships that hold a society together with all their rights, duties, and obligations are known as its social structure. Culture and society are two closely related concepts, and anthropologists study both. Obviously, there can be no culture without a society, just as there can be no society without individuals. Conversely, there are no known human societies that do not exhibit culture. Some other species of animals, however, do lead a social existence. Ants and bees, for example, instinctively cooperate in a manner that clearly indicates a degree of social organization. Yet, this instinctive behavior is not a culture. One can, therefore, have a society but not a human society without a culture, even though one cannot have a culture without a society. While a culture is shared by members of society, it is important to realize that not everything is uniform. For one thing, no one has exactly the same version of his or her culture. Beyond such individual variation, however, there is bound to the same father variation within a culture. At the very least, in any human society, there is some difference between the roles of men and women. This stems from the fact that women give birth but men do not, and that there are obvious differences between male and female bodies. What every culture does is to give meaning to these differences by explaining them and deciding what is to be done about them. Every culture also determines how these two different kinds of people should relate to one another and to the world at large. Since each culture does this in its own way, there is tremendous variation from one society to another. Anthropologists use the term gender to refer to the cultural systems and meanings assigned to the biological difference between the sexes. Thus, 
though one's sex is biologically determined, one's sexual identity or gender is culturally constructed. The distinction between sex, which is biological, and gender, which is cultural, is an important one. Presumably, gender differences are as old as human culture, about 2.5 million years. And arose from the biological differences between early human males and females. Early human males were about twice the size of females, just as males are today among such species as gorillas and orangutans, which are related to humans. In the course of human evolution, however, the biological differences between the two sexes were radically reduced. Thus, apart from differences directly related to reproduction, whatever biological basis there once was for general differences has largely disappeared. Nevertheless, cultures have maintained some distinctions of gender roles ever since, although these are far greater in some societies than in others. Strangely enough, Gender differences were more extreme in late 19th and early 20th century Western societies, where women were expected to submit completely to male authority than they are among most historically known pre-agricultural peoples whose ways of life resembled those of the late Stone Age ancestors of Western people. Among them, relations between men and women tend to be characterized by the spirit of equality, and although they may not typically carry out the same tasks, such arrangements tend to be flexible. In other words, differences between the behavior of men and women in Western societies today, which are thought by many to be rooted in human biology, are not so rooted at all. Rather, they appear to have been recently elaborated in the course of history. In addition to cultural variation associated with gender, there will also be some related to differences in age. In any society, children are not expected to behave as adults, and the reverse is equally true. But then, who is a child and who is an adult? Again, although the age differences are natural, cultures give their own meaning to the human life cycle. In the United States, for example, individuals are not regarded as adults until the age of 21. In many others, adulthood begins earlier. Often, it is not tied so much to age as is to passage through certain established rituals. Many people believe that nature's value cannot be put into dollars and cents. That is, they value the natural world for its own sake, regardless of what services or benefits it provides for humans. Yet, this notion is fundamentally at odds with the economic system we've created. We live in a world that is increasingly dominated by a global economy where it is assumed that everything of value has a price tag attached. If something can't be quantified and sold, it is considered worthless. The president of a forest company once said to me, a tree has no value until it's cut down. Then it adds value to the economy. So how do we reconcile our economy with ecology? The earth provides us with essential natural services like air and water purification and climate stability. But these aren't part of our economy because we've always assumed such things are free. But natural services are only free when the ecosystems that maintain them are healthy. Today, with our growing population and increasing demands on ecosystems, we are degrading them more and more. Unfortunately, remedial activities and products like air filters, bottled water, eye drops, and other things we need to combat degraded services all add to the GDP, which economists call growth. 
something is terribly wrong with our economic system when poor environmental health and reduced quality of life are actually good for the economy. But what if we did put a price tag on things like clean air and water? If we assigned a monetary value to natural systems and functions, would we be more inclined to conserve them? Yes, according to an international group of ecologists writing the latest edition of a journal Science. The group argues that humanity will continue to degrade natural systems until we realize that the costs to repair or replace them are enormous. So we must find a way to place a dollar value on all ecosystem assets. Natural resources such as fish or timber, life support processes such as water purification and pollination, and life enriching conditions like beauty and recreation. Most of these assets, with the exception of natural resources, we already exploit but do not trade in the marketplace because they are difficult to price. But this is changing. For example, this spring, an Australian organization became the first conservation group to be listed on a stock exchange. The company buys and restores native wildlife and vegetation while earning income from tourism and wildlife sales. In New York City, officials recently decided to buy land around watersheds and let the forest and soil organism filter water instead of building a massive new filtration plant. Until recently, this potential to use natural services rather than technology to solve problems has been largely overlooked even though natural approaches may provide greater benefits to communities, such as lower costs, reduced flooding and soil erosion, and authentic benefits. In Canada, forests are primarily valued for the timber they provide. But this leads to conflict. For instance, a recent report from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans found that logging roads in British Columbia continue to devastate fish-bearing streams, even though legislation is supposed to protect them. In fact, our forests provide many services that, if assigned a monetary value, could completely change the way we use them. As just one species out of perhaps 50 million, the notion of assigning value to everything on Earth solely for its utility to humans may seem like an act of incredible arrogance. But the harsh reality of today's world is that money talks and economies are a central preoccupation. At the very least, assigning monetary value to ecosystem services may force us to take a hard look at all the nature provides. Maybe then we'll stop taking it for granted. All of us know the old saying, you can't have your cake and eat it too. But most of us prefer to believe just the opposite. Such is the case now. As our society begins to realize the virtues of solar power, there is no doubt of the superiority of solar-based power over any other form of energy. Moreover, Economic realities guarantee that the world will move inevitably toward a solar age. Still, few people have stopped to analyze the profound implications of this shift in the energy base. Many seem to think that the solar age will be just like our own, only cleaner. In fact, this is far from the truth. Because solar radiation is diffuse, it must be concentrated to do work. Since the laws of thermodynamics tell us that work can only be performed when there is a temperature difference between two places, and since solar energy falls essentially equally on each square meter of the land anywhere, the solar flow must be collected. If electricity is desired, the stored solar energy must be transformed from one state into another. The nature of the flow and the economies of scale of solar technologies are most suited to small units, 
such as those that could provide enough heat and hot water for an individual home. At the industrial level, solar energy does not lend itself to the complex technological organization required by contemporary society. One estimate, for example, indicates that in order to run our current industrial superstructure, we will need to cover between 10 and 20 percent of the total U.S. land area with various types of solar collectors. If an ideally efficient recovery process were somehow possible, we could then support an industrial technological society through solar flow. But what will be the result? Simply this. We will continue to witness the exponential increase of entropy here on Earth as solar energy is used to convert more and more of our limited earthbound energy resources into the production process, transforming them from a usable to an unusable state. It is not, then, just the form of energy a society uses that is critical, it is also the amount of energy. If solar energy actually could flow in high concentrated forms for industrial use, we will experience many of the same economic and social dislocations that result from our high energy use now. Our future is a solar future. There can be no doubt of that. The question is whether we will continue in our old habits of thinking and fruitlessly attempt to generate a high technology resource intensive solar energy base that will hasten the degradation of the planet, or whether we will generate an energy base that at every step of its formation and use seeks to keep the flow of energy and resources at a minimum. There are important choices to be made, even on a small scale. In the high tech or active, home system, sunlight is first concentrated into a collector made of non-renewable resources. Then, the solar energy is stored in either air or water house in containers manufactured of non-renewables. Finally, it is moved by fans or pumps to perform the work required. Thus, small-scale home units of an active nature must still depend ultimately on the supply of copper, platinum, and other diminishing ores out of which the solar utilization equipment is manufactured. Passive home solar systems tend to be less ecologically damaging and provide the most net energy yield because they are based less on non-renewable technology and more in the life experiences of the first solar age that preceded the fossil fuel era. In a passive system, homes are actually designed and constructed in such a way that they naturally remain cool in summer and warm in winter. Some wildlife homes developed hundreds of years ago by people who have no other way to maintain their homes. The solar age will require a greater conformity to the ancient rhythms of life while small, appropriate technology relying on very limited remaining stocks of non-renewable energy is still used where absolutely essential. The bulk of the transforming work will return back to human and animal labor as it has in every other period of history before the industrial age. Regardless of how it proceeds, the coming transition is sure to be accompanied by suffering and sacrifice, but there is really no other choice. The fact is that the suffering will be minimized if the transition from the existing energy base to the new one is made now in a thoughtful, orderly manner, rather than later out of sheer panic and desperation. We are rapidly approaching the absolute limits of the fossil fuel energy environment. If we wait until we run suddenly up against the wall of this existing energy base, we will find that we have no energy cushion left to ease the transition process. Almost everyone has heard about global warming and how it could cause damage to our environment. Recent measurements of the oceans show 
that this warming is causing the sea level to rise by several millimeters every decade. Many island nations are concerned that within a century or so, their homes will disappear under water. Moreover, this rise in temperature, together with pollution and the loss of natural habitat, is said to be causing a huge loss in the diversity of life on Earth. When we think of changes like this, we call them disasters and believe that they are exceptional events in the life of our planet. This rise in temperature, however, is just one of many drastic changes in the Earth's existence. And as we shall see, some of these changes are even helpful and necessary for life. Perhaps the most famous disaster in the Earth's existence occurred 65 million years ago, when it's thought that an asteroid hit the Earth, causing the dinosaurs to go extinct. Although this was a disaster for the dinosaurs, it turned out to be good news for humans. It is almost certain that if the asteroid had not struck the Earth, you will not be reading this passage now. This shows us that disasters can sometimes have a happy ending. Although global warming has become a real concern, it is interesting to know that over the past one million years, the Earth's temperature has cooled down several times during the ice ages. These changes in temperature were also disastrous for some species, but they may have actually helped humans spread around the world. When the glaciers grew in size, the level of the sea fell and this may have made it possible for humans to reach new lands. For example, perhaps early Asians crossed into North America via a land bridge, which no longer exists. Smaller disasters such as forest fires and volcanoes may also be helpful. Often we hear stories of forest fires which destroy a huge number of trees and all the animal life that they contain. When this happens, we feel it is a shame that so much nature has been lost. However, it is now known that fires are actually necessary. Without fires, the tallest trees take all the sunlight, which creates very little diversity. However, diversity is important in any ecosystem. Without diversity, one disease could easily kill most life. Erupting volcanoes are another type of disaster, which often causes deaths and destruction. Yet, once again, they bring great benefits. The soil around volcanoes is usually very rich, which improves the quality of life for farmers and those living near them. Perhaps the greatest disaster for life in the existence of the Earth is one that we seldom think about. Two billion years ago, there was no oxygen on the Earth, and all forms of life consisted of creatures so tiny that they would be invisible to the human eye. Gradually, these creatures began producing oxygen as a waste product, just as plants do now. However, at that time, for most life, oxygen was poisonous. As oxygen increased from 0% of our atmosphere two billion years ago to the present 21%, species were formed to evolve. Naturally, many species must have died in the poisonous atmosphere. However, some managed to adopt, and these were our ancestors. While it may seem difficult to believe that oxygen can be poisonous to life, this shows us how disasters can produce strange and unpredictable results. The present disaster, which is happening before our eyes, is interesting because it is being caused by humans. Unlike past disasters, global warming is unique in that it is not natural. At this point, no one knows what the outcome of this environmental destruction will be. By studying disasters in the past, it is possible to predict 
that the big changes occur in today's environment will force humans to change if they are to survive. This discussion of disasters is probably both good news and bad news. The good news is that in all previous disasters, no matter how destructive they have been, some form of life has always survived. This means that there is a very good chance that global warming caused by humans may even be beneficial for some microscopic forms of life, which can evolve quickly. Unfortunately, species that thrive in worms include things like bacteria that can often cause disease. This leads us to the bad news, which suggests that this present disaster is almost certainly bad for large species like humans, which cannot evolve quickly. With temperatures rising so quickly, humans may not be able to adapt quickly enough to the new conditions on Earth. Although it seems cruel to say so, the extinction of humans will probably be good news for our planet. Our selfish behavior, which has led to the extinction of so many species, is obviously not good for life. The present disaster caused by humans may just be part of the cycle of destruction and rebirth that our planet has experienced for billions of years. The natural curiosity of scientists have often led them into controversial areas. When their curiosity is backed up by the resources of rich drug companies and is directed toward the secrets of life itself, however, it becomes a potential time bomb. Genetic research is racing ahead without giving society time to establish the parameters of acceptability. Cloning is one of the most controversial aspects of genetic engineering. When an animal is cloned, a twin is created. So far, the process has succeeded only with sheep, mice, cows, and pigs. But several researchers have announced plans to clone human beings. This has already been made illegal in Germany and is likely to be banned in all Western countries soon. Opponents of human cloning tend to emphasize the risks of children being born with severe defects. But there is also a fear that the technique, once perfected, would be abused in various ways, together with a sense that the creation of life is something sacred and should be left to God. Where the cloning of animals is concerned, however, there is a much less opposition American scientists managed to clone a gaur, an endangered Asian species of ox, by implanting a gaur embryo into the womb of a cow. Although the baby died two days later, its birth was hailed as a major breakthrough, which could benefit not only endangered species such as pandas and tigers, but even species which have already died out. When the last burkado, a mountain goat died recently, scientists removed some cells in order to produce clones. Some Japanese researchers are even more ambitious. They hope to clone a mammoth using DNA extracted from cells taken from a frozen mammoth's carcass in Siberia or Alaska and inserted into the womb of a living elephant. Another use of genetic engineering is in gene therapy. Many diseases occur because a particular gene is missing or defective. Researchers in Philadelphia have found a way to restore such genes by attaching normal genes to a harmless virus and then infecting the patient. A similar technique has already been used to cure a certain kind of blindness in dogs and may easily be adapted to cure humans too. Now that researchers can identify missing or defective genes, it's possible to predict illnesses long before symptoms appear. While this enables people to take preventive action by making appropriate changes to their lifestyles or diet, it also gives insurance companies the chance to identify bad risks. 
and above average risk of breast cancer, for example, can be discovered through genetic testing. And some insurance companies now insist that female applicants reveal the results of such tests and raise their fees to cover the increased risk. Once insurance companies demand such information as a matter of course, potential employers will no doubt follow suit, rejecting high risk job applicants. Of all the applications of genetic engineering, the one which has most outraged the public is the genetic modification of food crops and livestock. In 1996, the first genetically modified tomatoes reached the market. This was followed by potatoes and other crops such as corn, soybeans, and rapeseed, containing genes enabling them to kill insects or to withstand heavy doses of herbicides. And by genetically altered livestock, such as pigs with genes that made them grow bigger and heavier, cows genetically altered to produce more milk, and salmon with growth accelerating genes. A few people questioned the safety of these products and were assured by industry and government officials that they were absolutely no different from ordinary food products. Questions about their effects on the environment were also brushed aside. By 1999, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration had approved 44 genetically modified crops, including a third of all corn and a half of all soybeans growing in the U.S. In Europe, however, there was growing resentment at the way GM foods had been forced on the public. Consumers began demanding labels that allowed them to distinguish between GM and non-GM products. When the Americans refused to sell them separately, British supermarkets stopped buying their corn and soybeans. Environmentalists wanted proof that modified crops would not harm other species. On the contrary, they heard reports from Cornell University of a drastic decline in a monarch butterfly population related to pollen from GM corn. Then came the announcement that U.S. agribusinesses had developed a terminator gene, which could be inserted into their seeds to ensure that farmers could not follow the traditional practice of taking seeds from their own crops for use the following year. Development agencies were furious. If such seeds were marketed to developing countries, farmers would become totally dependent on American agribusinesses. The resulting bad publicity led to a hasty denial by the producers of any plan to market such seeds. The harmful effects of genetically modified crops on the environment are gradually appearing the disappearance of benevolent insects, the growth of herbicide-resistant weeds, the contamination of nearby organic farms. Health problems have also surfaced, including a reported increase in allergies and a decrease in the effectiveness of antibiotic drugs. It has seemed likely more serious problems develop in due course. There will be huge lawsuits and some biotech companies may go bankrupt. However, the system, which has allowed them to gamble with our health and environment, will remain. A system in which priority is given to technological development and profit rather than to safety and social responsibility. Natural and inevitable though it may be, Death confuses us nowadays. All too often, dying seems like a mysterious process full of difficult decisions, like the dilemma Michelle Finn faced after she decided to have her severely brain-damaged husband's feeding tube withdrawn, allowing him to die. So complex and painful are the medical and ethical questions surrounding such an event that is easy to overlook the fact that until recently, 
we had a single simple medical understanding of death. We accepted that people died when their hearts stopped beating and they stopped breathing. It is the absence of those signs that doctors still use to decide death about 90% of the time in hospitals today. Over the past 30 years, though, medical advances have undermined this simple understanding and forced physicians to look beyond the heart for an additional means of defining the end of life. Now the doctors are able to keep a patient's heart beating mechanically or replace a damaged heart with a new one, we have turned to the brain as a place to decide death. The brain cannot be transplanted or replaced by any machine. Without a working brain, people cannot breathe or maintain their blood pressure. They also lose the traits that we commonly associate with humanness, such as their ability to communicate, as well as any awareness of their surroundings. Although widely accepted in medical practice, the concept of brain death has spawned a host of medical, legal, ethical, and philosophical debates, and recently has come under attack by different religious or political groups. Some say that defining death should not be left to physicians, that the death of the brain is not the same as the death of a person. Others resist any definition of death that is based on science and technology. The first challenge came in the late 50s with the invention of life support machines that could keep the heart beating. According to the traditional way of thinking about death, patients who are supported by this kind of machine are still alive, but they cannot recover from severe brain damage, which means they will never again be aware of their surroundings, recognize or respond to their loved ones, or have any thoughts or emotions. There's a second challenge arising from the medical and technological advances. A dying person may be a potential donor of vital organs, such as the heart or lungs. If a surgeon operates quickly enough, a heart that has stopped in one body can be removed and transplanted into another, where it can return to normal working, possibly for many years. The stopping of the heart, then, is not a satisfactory way of deciding death. It is important to understand that brain damage is not an all-or-nothing state, though. Some patients cannot move but can breathe or their hearts still keep pumping. Others have lost any brain working and can be maintained solely by machines. The distinction between the two conditions is important. Withdrawing life support in a hopelessly brain damaged person, as in the first condition, will result in brain death. But that person is not actually brain dead at the time the decision is made. In the second condition, the patient is already brain dead. The importance of this distinction is evident not only for doctors treating brain damaged patients and for families who need to understand their loved one's condition, but also in the question of supplying organs for a transplant patient. Since transplantation techniques were first developed, it has been clear there will be more potential recipients than donors. The primary responsibility of the potential donor's medical team is proper care of the patient and the patient's family. Until a patient is declared brain dead, absolutely no steps should be taken to preserve organs for donation. Even if the patient has declared his or her wishes to donate organs or carries a donor card. Without clear guidelines for brain death, the basis for deciding to stop life support machines and to remove organs for transplant will be vague, subjective, and likely to change often. What was the greatest scientific discovery of the 20th century? Nuclear energy? The structure of DNA? The theory of digital computation? The Big Bang? 
It was an exceptional century of discovery. How do we choose one discovery over any other? The physician Louis Thomas made a choice. He bluntly asserts, the greatest of all the accomplishments of 20th century science has been the discovery of human ignorance. The science writer Timothy Ferris agrees. Our ignorance, of course, has always been with us and always will be. What is new is our awareness of it, and it is this, more than anything else, that marks the coming of age of our species. It is an odd and selling thought that the greatest discovery of the last century should be the confirmation of our ignorance. How did such a thing come about? The discovery of our ignorance followed inevitably from discoveries of the vastness of the universe. I began my course in astronomy at Stanhill College holding in my hands a 16-inch clear acrylic celestial globe spangled with stars. A smaller terrestrial globe is at the center and a tiny yellow ball representing the sun circles between Earth and the sky. This tidy cosmos of concentric spheres was invented thousands of years ago to account for the apparent motions of sun, moon, and stars. And for the task, it still works pretty well. When we thought we lived in such a universe, we could believe that a complete catalog of its contents was possible. The universe was proportioned to the human scale, created specifically for our home. Presumably, since it was made for us, the universe contained nothing beyond the understanding of the human mind. Then, in the winter of 1610, Galileo turned his newly crafted telescope to the Milky Way and saw stars in uncountable numbers. Stars that served no apparent purpose in the human scheme of things since they could not be seen by human eyes. It was an ominous hint of the cascading discoveries to come. I and my astronomy course with the Hubble Space Telescope's deep field photograph. A tender exposure of a part of the dark night sky so tiny that it could be covered by the intersection of cross pins held at arm's length. In this photo, are contained the images of several thousand galaxies, each galaxy consisting of hundreds of billions of stars and planet systems. A survey of the bowl of the Big Dipper at the same scale would show 40 million galaxies. Galaxies as numerous as snowflakes in a storm, each with uncountable planets, strange geographies, perhaps life forms, intelligent beings. To live in such a universe is to admit that the human mind, singly or collectively, will never be in possession of final knowledge. Ferris quotes the philosopher Karl Popper, the more we learn about the world, and the deeper our learning, the more conscious, specific, and clear we'll be our knowledge of what we do not know, our knowledge of our ignorance. For this, indeed, is the main source of our ignorance, the fact that our knowledge can be only finite, while our ignorance must necessarily be infinite. How do we react to this new and humbling knowledge? That depends, I suppose, on our temperament. Some of us are frightened by the vast spaces of ignorance and seek refuse in the human-centered universe of the acrylic star globe. Others are inspired by the opportunities for further discovery for the new vistas that will surely open before us. It is the latter frame of mind that drives science. The physicist Heinz Pagels wrote, the capacity to tolerate complexity and welcome contradiction, not the need for simplicity and certainty, is the attribute 
of an explorer. Centuries ago, when some people suspended their search for absolute truth and began instead to ask how things worked, modern science was born. Curiously, it was by abandoning the search for absolute truth that science began to make progress, opening the material universe to human exploration. The discovery of our ignorance should not be conceived as a negative thing. Ignorance is a vessel waiting to be filled, permission for growth, a foundation for the electrifying encounter with mystery. Now we can claim with optimism that we know both more and less than we knew at the beginning of the last century. More because our inventory of knowledge has been greatly expanded. Less because the scope of ignorance has been even more greatly realized. Timothy Ferris writes No thinking man or woman ought really to want to know everything. For when knowledge and its analysis is complete, thinking stops. <laughs>